Hey you guys, welcome to Tomes of Terror, my little humble book review show. The book that we have this week, this is kind of like a weird, I don't want to say it's like a wild card, but it's kind of like a thing where this is a book that I just bought it on a whim like a really long time ago. Remember back, I don't know if they if they still have this, but you know like Barnes and Noble, maybe like Books a Million and stuff like that. Like usually in the front of the store, they'd have all of these kind of shelves and they had a lot of hardcovers and stuff like that that were usually like really, really cheap. They'd be like, you know, five bucks or something like that. Cause sometimes it'd be books that had subsequently come out in paperback and they were trying to like get rid of all their, uh, you know, of all their stock of the hardcovers. I don't know if that was the case with this one, but this was just a book that I just kind of saw at random. I'd never heard of the author. I'd never heard anybody talk about it, but I just kind of liked the cover. And I was kind of like, cause the cover, uh, which this is not the same cover that the paperback has. So, uh, you know, so I might not have even picked it up otherwise, but see the cover here, it's called Enamorata, by the way, by Joseph Ganjemi. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Sorry if I'm not, uh, Joseph, but see, look, it's kind of like, looks very like, Ooh, spiritualism with like the seance and stuff. And, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I love shit about seances and spiritualism and stuff for like from that time period. Like I just really, really like stories about that. So I picked it up and I read like the inside blurb and I was like, oh man, that sounds pretty good. So I just like picked it up. I think it was, like I said, I think it was like 4 dollars or something like that. And this was like years and years ago because this book came out in 2004, which I don't know. I don't remember how old it was when I first bought it. I probably bought it in like fucking, I don't know, 2008, something like that maybe even earlier. I don't remember. But, uh, but yeah, so I read it and I really, really liked it at the time. And then, you know, stuck it back on my shelves as I, as I do with all of the books that I buy. And then while I was kind of casting about for, you know, another book to do like for this series, um, I still had a couple that I had bought that I needed to get to like to read and, you know, eventually like, but I'm getting through like the pile that I bought, which is good. I think I only have one or two left. But the thing about it was that I was like, well, after that, I might go to like Kindle Unlimited. I'll go to like ebook and stuff like that until I can afford to buy another pile of books. But when I was looking through my shelves, I was like, you know, I have a bunch of books here that I wouldn't actually mind rereading. And then I could like review them for the show. And Enamorata was one of them because I was kind of like, I was going through the shelves and I was kind of like, man, I remember that being really good. Let me read it again and, you know, see if it holds up. And if it holds up, then I'm going to review it for the show because I feel like maybe maybe it should get a little bit more attention. I don't know, like, I feel like this author has not written much more than this. Like, I think he's written a couple more books, but not much. This was actually his first novel. When I looked to this up on Goodreads, there's only three pages of reviews, which for Goodreads, that's like hardly anything. So I don't know. So I may be like one of the few people that read this. I'm not really sure, but uh, which is a shame because this book is really, really good. And honestly, I remember liking it like when I first read it back in the 2000s or whatever, but rereading it, I, I was like, man, I forgot how fucking good this book is. It's just like, so it's not, it's not a straight up horror novel. It's kind of more like a spiritualist ghost story-ish mystery. And it also has like a little bit of a romance thing going on, but not in a blah, like not in, not in that kind of way. Cause I don't like that shit either. Um, so there is kind of like a sort of love story, sort of, but that's not really the main part of the plot. Now, interestingly, one thing that I guess I had forgotten in the years since I had first read this book was that this book is actually based on, or it's fictionalized, everyone's names are changed and stuff, and a lot of details are changed too, but this is actually based on, a, on real uh, events. So what happens in this book? It's set in 1923. And uh, there's the guy, the main guy uh, who you, we see everything's it's in the first person. His name is Martin Finch, and he's actually a grad student uh, at Harvard. And he gets called in by this guy, McLaughlin, who's like the head of, uh, you know, whatever department that he's studying in. And uh, this McLaughlin guy is also the head of the local like Society for Psychical Research chapter. And the, they work for, he's working for Scientific American. Now, Scientific American, and this is true, in the 1920s when spiritualism was all the rage, uh, Scientific American offered $5,000 in 1920s money. I don't even know how that's, I mean, that's got to be like, that's a astronomical sum. So I'm like, that's still kind of a lot of money nowadays. So in 1920s, I can't imagine like how much fuck, that must have been like a million bucks or something. 
But uh, so yes, they were offering $5,000 to anyone who could demonstrate actual genuine psychic ability uh, in usually like in a seance type of setting or like while this investigating committee was there. And like I said, that was a real, uh, that was a real thing. That was a real thing that they offered. And there was a committee that would go around to seances and go around and visit different psychics and stuff. Uh, psychics who were trying to get the prize, you know what I mean? Because obviously $5,000, so they're going to get all kind of people like, coming in there. Now, in real life, uh, one of the guys that was on the committee was Harry Houdini. Um, he's not really a character in this book. He does, he is mentioned a couple of times, like he is, you know, there, like in this universe, but he's, um, not like on the committee, like he was in real life. So like I said, this is, it's based a lot on real shit, but th he changed a lot of stuff around. But when I was reading some of like the Wikipedia entries about some of the real shit that happened in here, um, he didn't change as much as I thought that, that he might have. But so Martin Finch, he is, uh, like I said, a grad student. Now, what ends up happening is that McLaughlin, uh, they're supposed to go and investigate this uh, supposed psychic medium whose name is Mina Crawley. Now, this woman was suggested to them by Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, you know, who's also, like I said, not a character in the book, but he is brought up in the book's universe. And him saying, and Arthur Conan Doyle uh, saying, you know, she, we think she's the real thing. She's the one that might get the prize and everything like that. Now, unlike most of the other psychics uh, who actually petitioned Scientific American, hey, come see my magical psychic powers uh, so I can win $5,000, um, she didn't actually want to do it. So the committee actually went to her and like wrote her a letter because she had been recommended by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And uh, you know, want you know, do you want us to investigate you and get the prize money and everything like that? And for a long time, she didn't want to do it. Like she refused, she's like, I don't need the money. And uh, you know, she's like, I don't really want to you know, go into that kind of scrutiny or anything like that. But they finally convinced her to do it. Now, what ends up happening is that McLaughlin, who is supposed to be like the head of the committee for the scientific uh, American investigation team, he ends up like slipping on some ice or something and like busting his hip or whatever. So he ends up sending Martin Finch in his place, like the grad student. And uh, one of the things that Martin Finch is good at is that he's really good at kind of building things. Like he has kind of like an engineering type of mind. He's good at kind of engineering these little things that will that will make it apparent like if psychics are faking, you know what I mean? Like he's really good at kind of like building, like for this one, like at the beginning of the book, like he kind of builds this one thing that kind of goes under the floorboard so they can tell like if the psychic gets up or something like that. So he makes kind of all these little contraptions uh, that are meant to kind of catch all these psychics out, like when they're at the seances. So he gets sent along in his place and uh, there's four other dudes, uh, three or four other dudes on the committee, uh, all of whom are kind of pissed that this young upstart, who's only 24, I think, uh, is gonna be there on McLaughlin's behalf because McLaughlin was supposed to be kind of the head of the thing. And now this little, this young whippersnapper is there in their place. And it, it kind of seems like too that so there's all these kind of like, you know, <laughs> inter-academia kind of uh, infighting and they just don't want to listen to him because they think he's just like wet behind the ears and there's all this other kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, McLaughlin couldn't come and he just sent you instead and we're not going to like listen to you or respect you or anything like that. But when they get to, uh, they go to Philadelphia, which is where uh, Mina Crawley lives with her husband, who is an, uh, uh, he's an obstetrician, like a surgeon. And uh, so they go there, and what ends up happening is that the bitchy other members of the committee, they got there before Martin Finch did and basically got their own rooms and said that, that, that there was only three of them. So when he goes there to check into the hotel that he's supposed to check into, they're just like, oh, sorry, no room for you. I don't know how that could have happened. You know what I mean? Like, very, very bitchy. So uh, being kind of ballsy, he's like, well, you know what? Um, I'm going to go over to... Mina Crawley's house, like her and her husband's house. And since we're going to be over there anyway, like investigating them and maybe I could crash over there. So he does that. And it turns out that they're really uh, accommodating and very welcoming and stuff like that. Now, as the book goes on, uh, some complications arise in the sense that there's kind of a thing where Martin Finch sort of starts to fall for Mina Crawley. Uh, which kind of starts to cloud his objectivity because he doesn't really want to hurt her feelings by saying that he thinks she's a fake. 
But then as the, as it goes on and they have more and more seances and he kind of devises different things to like see if she's faking and so it seems like she might be faking some stuff, but then there's some other stuff that doesn't seem like she's faking. So it's just all very kind of like ambiguous. Now what it is is that when she uh she when she's at the seance, she said she never used to have psychic powers before. But suddenly she had like some kind of tragedy happen like a year prior. And then all of a sudden she kind of discovered this latent psychic ability. And what she does is that she goes, she has the seance in the dark and everything. And then she has a spirit control who uh, is this dude named Walter, who you find out uh, about halfway through the book was actually her brother. So uh, apparently her brother has died and is now serving as a spirit control and is uh, kind of like angry. Like he's an angry kind of ghost. During some of the seances, there's kind of shit like, you know, pianos banging the keys of uh, the piano or banging downstairs. Like he knocks shit over like the China cabinet and everything like that. So as it goes on, like they're trying to like the investigating team have all uh, are all kind of like charmed by Mina Crawley because she's just such a, such a lovely person not just like a physically you know lovely person but she's also like you know uh, you know she she's just like a really nice person and so they real fi- feel really bad of you know having to do things like oh we have to tie her ankles to the chair so she can't move her feet and we have to do this that and the other thing and all these kind of protocols that they have to come up with to make sure that she's not faking and uh so as it goes on they all kind of become charmed by her and they don't really want to do that so there's all this kind of like you know things with the objectivity and there's a thing too where martin finch who essentially falls in love with her, but is the most skeptical and is the most suspicious that there's something weird going on. Uh, whereas the other three guys are just kind of like, fuck it. We just, you know, she's she's real. We'll give her the prize. And they just kind of wanted to go to Philadelphia and and eat on the Scientific American's expense account. And, you know, just, yeah, we're gonna give somebody the money and then we're gonna publish this big article about it and it'll sell all these copies and we'll get, you know, promotions and all this other kind of shit. So they're not real rigorous uh, about, you know, trying to like disprove her actual psychic ability. So there's like a lot of, so there's like a lot of conflict like between the group and everything like that. And like I said, there's also a lot of conflict in the household because he is very clearly falling for Mina. She seems to be falling for him as well. But then there's like some really weird shit going on with her and her husband and it's just, it's just really weird. Like her husband, who's like I said, a surgeon, like he'll do weird shit like he's kind of like overshares like too much information and it's almost kind of like he's encouraging something to happen between Mina and Martin. Like he'll be like, oh, well, you know, she, after the seance, she's really tired. I have to go to work and do these surgeries. So why don't you stay in the house and like look after her for me and like shit like that. So there's like all this kind of weird shit going on. And then there's stuff like they put him in a room, like in a guest room that's like butts up to their bedroom. So it's like, sometimes he thinks he can hear them having sex. So there's like really weird shit going on. So there's all kind of weird shit going on in there. When they do the seances and Walter, the spirit control starts talking you know there's this whole thing about him and uh the the doctor dr crawley like not getting along and uh you know so they're kind of like coming up with all these uh insults toward each other and all this other stuff so you're not entirely sure like what the end like you don't know if walter is really a ghost or if she's pulling some kind of trick if her and the husband are both pulling some kind of trick if there's somebody else that's in on it Uh, so Martin, like I said, is kind of like the whole thing is almost kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a detective, like a mystery because he's kind of bound and determined, even though he's fallen in love with her and doesn't want to hurt her feelings by saying she's a fake because she does genuinely seem to believe that she has psychic abilities, but he really wants to get to the bottom of, does she really have psychic abilities or is there something like a lot more complicated going on because there's all this kind of like sketchy shit going on around this kind of thing. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, this is actually based loosely on real events. So the Scientific American thing, uh, you know, where they went and investigated psychics and everything with Harry Houdini, that really did happen. Uh, They were actually offering $5,000. Mina Crawley in this book uh, is actually based on Mina Crandon, uh, who they called Marjorie. Uh, she's very, very famous in spiritualist uh, parapsychology circles. She actually also claimed to have a spirit control that was named Walter, that I believe was her dead brother. 
And uh, interestingly, I was reading her Wikipedia page. Go look up Mina Crandon. Uh, you know, so like I said, in paranormal circles, very, very well-known uh, spirit medium. And she was investigated multiple times. Uh, she actually, allegedly, <laughs> that they know of, did actually have an affair with at least one of the investigating committee. Uh, you know, again, kind of getting in with their objectivity and everything like that. So a lot of the shit that he's talking about, like in this book, it is fictionalized. Every, like everyone's names are cha- names are changed and some of the personalities are kind of switched around but a surprising amount of the story in this is based on the real story of mina crandon like or marjorie she her husband was also uh you know a surgeon so it's like there was just all this kind of stuff going on and it's all the backbiting and fighting like with the investigation committee like some of them wanting to like say you know certify her as real and the other ones thinking she was faking and there's all this other kind of stuff so it's really kind of a fascinating i mean what a what a great uh thing to like base a story on and like i said it was just i really really liked this a lot like i said it's not a horror novel necessarily it's more like a mystery but if you really like and I'm and the period detail in this like for you know all the stuff from like the 1920s is really really good like he doesn't dump you over the head like it's not like a big exposition dump it's like oh and then there's not pages and pages of like exposition of describing things because everything's from Martin Finch's point of view you know on the investigation committee like it's in first person so you know he th- they just mention things he just mentions things like in passing like different kinds of cars like different kinds of products that were available at the time so it's like really really cool it really gives you a sense of place and it really gives you a sense of place of like philadelphia which is where the author is uh from i don't think he's from there originally i think he's from delaware but he moved to philadelphia uh and he lived there when he wrote this so he kind of so philadelphia in the 1920s almost becomes kind of like a character in itself which is kind of neat but if you're really really into seances which i love I love anything about that. Like I said, that's immediately like why I picked this book up because like I saw like the seance kind of thing with, you know, and I love all that spiritualist kind of theme uh, for, for a story. And I'm really glad I picked this one up. I had forgotten too how funny this book is. Not like, not like over the top funny. Like, you know, it's not like that. It's just kind of like just the, the observations that the main character makes Uh, And the turns of phrases are just, like, very, very witty and, like, very, very amusing to me. But, uh, yeah, and it's also, like, a super fast read. I mean, I – because, actually, I kind of got ahead on my book reviews because – you know, when I did the amulet last week and that took me like almost no time at all to read because that was such a good time. And then this one, I kind of started it and then like I didn't want to put it down. Like I seriously, I, I read it like in two sittings and I was like, man, I forgot like how good this was, like how good the mystery is, um, you know, how it kind of like strings you along and you're just like, what the fuck is going on with this lady? It's like, is she really, is she crazy? Is, 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 is she really a psychic? Is she really channeling this ghost? It's like, you know, or is there some other kind of shit going on? Is she being hypnotized? It's like, there's all kind of different possibilities and it's just like really really intriguing but yeah it just when i read all the reviews on goodreads most of them seemed kind of like there were some that like really really loved it because i really loved this book i thought it was and i actually i enjoyed it much more this time than i did the first time i read it because i had forgotten like how well written it was how kind of wryly amusing it was uh how fast paced it is and just kind of like the whole spiritualist vibe like in the whole like i said that's really evocative of 1920s philadelphia and evocative of the whole like kind of spiritualist uh movement and i really really like the way that was conveyed like it just kind of kept me it's just really it's really immersive and i was really into it um it seemed like a lot of the reviews that were mostly like were like three stars it's like oh this was okay but I, i don't know if people were like expecting more of a straight up ghost story or more of a straight up horror story. Like I said, this is more like, it's kind of like a ghost story, but it's more like a mystery. So, you know, so if you are into that kind of stuff, cause like I said, I like, I like all that kind of stuff, like seances, debunking seances, like all the shit about Houdini and everything like that. I find that shit really fascinating. You know, all the stuff about Arthur Conan Doyle and his kind of like forays into spiritualism. I'm really fascinated by that kind of stuff. So if you like that kind of stuff, um, this is a really, really good fictionalized account, even though a lot of it uh, is based on real stuff that happened like right around that time. But like I said, it's really well written. Um, I don't think this guy has written that many more books, but 
now that I've reread this one and enjoyed it so much, uh, I was kind of like, well, maybe I should go look for some of his other books too, because maybe some other ones, because like I said, this subject matter is like right up my alley. So <laughs> there you go. And I feel like it doesn't, it hasn't really got a lot of reviews. It hasn't really got a lot of attention. And somebody on Goodreads though said this one. Now I don't know if this is true or not, because it's just the only source for it that I saw was like one person on Goodreads said that Johnny Depp had purchased the rights to this book in 2006 with the hopes of making it into a movie, but obviously that never happened. I don't, not that I know of. I don't know if that's true or not, but it was like, actually, I think this would make kind of a cool ass movie now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know, I just think it would. But like I said, that's that's me. I like that kind of, I like that kind of 1920s setting. I like the spiritualist setting. So if you, if that sounds like something that you would uh, really be into, and like I said, it's more of a mystery, um, then definitely check this one out. Uh, as I said, this, I, I really like this cover actually, and this is what first attracted me to. It's very, very striking. Uh, I think the paperback actually just has, I I think it's like black or blue with like a bird on it because Martin Finch and and actually I think the real guy that he's supposed to be was actually named Malcolm Bird and I think if I'm remembering it correctly that in the book like in the universe of the book Martin Finch they write an article about the investigation and they give him the pseudonym Martin Bird even though like I said in real life his real name was Martin Bird so or uh yeah Malcolm Bird so I think if I remember in that correctly but yeah seriously check this book out it's really really fun it's really really good and it's you know it kind of keeps you guessing like all the way to the end and it leaves some things like ambiguous enough that you can kind of like fill in a lot of your own blanks which I thought was kind of good too so uh so yeah so check it out if you've read it uh on the off chance because like I said, I don't really hear that many people talking about it, but if you have read it, uh, let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.